and it is my privilege to introduce to you Dr. Gururaj Desh Deshpande or Desh Deshpande as he is very formally, popularly known in Massachusetts and in the US. Um, Dr. Deshpande is, uh, was born in Hubli in Karnataka and is an Indian American entrepreneur and a venture capitalist investor. Uh, he is best known for his internet startup, the uh, Sycamore Networks, which was also based in this very own state of Massachusetts. Um, Dr. Deshpande is well known for having for spurring technology and innovation by setting up centers at MIT, um, at his own Deshpande Foundation, and quite recently at my and his own alma mater, IIT Madras, with the Gopal Krishna Deshpande Center for Technology for Innovation. And this has been set up as recently as 2017. Dr. Uh, Deshpande is also is also chairman of Tejas Networks, which is about to recently is going to go into an IPO, and this has been his uh, passion project for a long, long time. And we congratulate Dr. Deshpande for that one. He is also the chairman of Sparta Group and a life member of the board for MIT. In July 2010, Mr. Deshpande was appointed by President Obama, sorry, former President Obama, uh, as the co-chairman of National Advisory Council and he was here to support Obama's innovation strategy. Dr. Deshpande has continued to demonstrate his passion for entrepreneurship through his philanthropic efforts in setting up grants and centers, which I've already mentioned. His all, these centers have worked with over 1,000 entrepreneurs since inception, and we thank Deshpande for his full support for the same. Um, Dr. Deshpande and his wife, Ms. J Mrs. Jashri Deshpande, were also instrumental in setting up the second girls' hostel in IIT Madras, for Sharawati. Thank you, doctor, for saying, doing the same thing. Um, he's, he's well known for his simplicity and humor, and I'm, I'm hopeful you'll have a great entertaining session from, and learning session, enlightening session from Dr. Deshpande. Dr. Deshpande, I would welcome you on stage. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you. I know it's been a long two days. You've heard a lot of new ideas, not of a lot of new impactful programs and so on. So, you know, new ideas, innovations, we need them because if you don't have them, you can make a difference. But even a powerful idea does not have an impact unless it's relevant. So today, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and connect those three ideas, innovation, relevance and impact. And so just to give you a little context for where I'm coming from, you know, I, I graduated IIT Madras 1973, did my master's, PhD, taught for a little bit, and then we moved to Boston in 1984 and was an entrepreneur, did about 10 companies, and then joined the uh, board of MIT in 2000. And then the, the first sort of, you know, uh, idea that we had was how do we create more opportunities for entrepreneurs with big ideas, like the ones that we had? You know, a lot of the ideas that we had to start companies in the 70s and 80s came from places like Bell Labs. And by 2000, there were more, no more Bell Labs. And so, and the US taxpayers spent about $50 billion a year to, to support innovation. And so the idea was, is there anything we can do to make that investment create more opportunities for entrepreneurs. And so we set up a center at MIT, and the, and the core idea behind that center is innovation plus relevance is equal to impact, meaning you know, the, the practice of innovation uh, at universities is roughly where engineering innovation was about 50 years ago. 50 years ago, engineers innovated things in a dark room and then the companies hired sales and marketing. Some worked, some didn't work. So a lot of the innovator, innovators in universities, they innovate, and the best among them patent it. And then the technology licensing officers try to look for ways to use those patents. And so the, the number of ideas that have an impact is, is actually very modest. Uh, MIT, Harvard, uh, Stanford, all these places, I mean, they lead that practice. But there is a lot more that they could be doing. And therefore, the idea behind this is that if a person have a desire for impact, not every researcher needs to have a desire for impact. For example, out of the 1,000 faculty at MIT, 
there's about 50 professors who are more like Nobel Prize kind of guys, and you need to leave them alone because their ideas would have an impact maybe 30, 40 years from now. But most of them, 95% of them, want to do something. They want to cure cancer. They want to create clean water. They want to create clean energy or something. And so if they have a desire for impact, the chances of their idea having an impact goes up quite a bit if you connect it to relevance, if you connect it to problems. Because as they navigate through the idea, as they bake the idea, it's more likely that the idea is relevant and therefore it'll have a big pull in the marketplace. And, and so, so far we've funded maybe about 120 programs and about 40 of them have become startups and, and that's been a pretty powerful way to make ideas have an impact. And now it's become a part of the NSF program and there's about 100 other universities which are part of the network to sort of bring about that practice to innovation. So, so this impact usually happens on the developed economies. On the, if you look at the, the pyramid, let's say the seven billion people, and you break it up into roughly two billion and five billion, the two billion who, who do have a lot of income, have disposable income, and if they have a problem, they're looking for solutions. They're actively looking for solutions. And therefore, if you have a big idea, and if you direct that idea to some problem that those people have, the idea will find a way to have an impact on, on that two billion people. And, and, and all the ecosystem that you need to make those ideas impactful are in place. I mean, there is distribution channels, there's Amazon, there's Kmart, there's Walmart, there's all kinds of stuff, there's access to capital. Uh, like, like everything that you need to make those ideas impactful exists. So as long as you have a big idea and you direct it to some burning problem of those people, you, you'll find a way to have an impact. Now, about 10 years ago, uh, we said, let's do something about this in India. And, and so instead of doing technological innovation, we thought we would do social innovation. And for social innovation, obviously, the customer base that you're targeting is at the bottom, bottom of the pyramid. And, and so for the bottom of the pyramid, suddenly that equation changes. It's really relevance plus innovation is equal to impact, meaning it's the deep understanding of the problem itself, which is the core competence. And the new idea that you bring to solve the problem does not have to be patentable, first time in the world, hugely competitive, but it has to be very relevant. So, so to experiment with this idea about 10 years ago, we started this program called the Social Innovation Sandbox. In, in Hubli, which is halfway between Bangalore and Mumbai. And, and over the last 10 years, it's grown into a, a major program. And I would like to share with you the learnings of that part of it, which was a new experience for us, because all my career, uh, on all my education, everything else, I came from impacting with, with big technical ideas. And in social innovation, it turns out that, that you, unless you co-create the solution with the people who need it, you can't, you can't have an impact. So it's been about 10 years. Uh, it's a pretty large program now. We've got about 400 people on the payroll. We've you know, invested close to 200 crores and so on. So the learnings can be summarized into three things. If you want to have an impact, number one, you have to co-create the solution with the people whom you're trying to help. Because unless you understand your customer base, you won't, you won't come up with the right product. And, and people like us, it's very hard for us to understand the risk tolerance of people who live on a dollar a day or two dollars a day. And therefore, you have to co-create the solution. Secondly, there is no distribution channels there. It's not like these people have a lot of disposable income and they're actively looking for solutions. And so, so it's not that if you find a great solution for the problems they have, that you can just plug it in and bang, it has, a, it has an impact. So you have to create that capacity to actually spread the solution out. And, and so, and that's very important. So, so to do that, we started this program, a skilling program, and, and this program is essentially for people who have 10 years of education, 12 years, 15 years, 17 years of education. And, and you know, as, as you know, people in India, they get educated, but they, really not capable of anything and they can't get a job. And, and this training program has turned out to be a pretty amazing thing. 
It's a four-month program, and within four months, you can pretty much take anybody and change their mindset. So it's a residential program. It's a very, you know, a very minimalistic residential program. It's not like it's luxurious quarters or anything like that. But all these kids, they wake up at 5 o'clock, they come to the center, do some yoga, go back, do something or the other, go to bed at 11, up at 5. And a lot of these people have never felt that passion, unlike most of us in this room, where we fall in love with the problem and, you know, we can't sleep for several days and so on. These people have never felt that, that, that work ethic. And so first month is very hard for them. But after the first month, it's amazing to see the amount of pride they take in the fact that they're working so hard. Secondly, they're taught to communicate, you know, because, because there's a lot of this yes sir culture where it doesn't matter what you ask people to do in India, they'll say yes sir, because that's the easiest way to get rid of the problem. And, and so these people really learn to communicate. They look at your eyes and, and talk to you and, and either agree or disagree with you. And then they taught some computers, and then they taught whatever the domain knowledge, agriculture, or electrician, or, or uh, social entrepreneurship, uh, general sales, whatever, you know, lots of different things. And, and so this has turned out to be a fantastic program where, you know, we have had 4,000 graduates now, and not a single person doesn't have a job. Everybody gets a job, because in India, what we find is that what you need for a lot of people is people who can show up to work on time and say what they mean and mean what they say, and, and, and the domain expertise that you need to actually do a lot of these jobs is very minimal. And so, and, and, and so we are building a big campus, 300,000 square foot campus, and we'll be graduating 5,000 people every year from this campus, and the programs are anywhere from four months to six months. And, and so a lot of these 5,000 people make $4 a day. And, and at that salary, which is about 10,000 rupees a month, they're pretty happy. And it's amazing to see their passion, amazing to see. You know, in fact, just, we just came back from an annual conference these kids put together. And, and actually, it was almost as good as the HBS conference. It's amazing to see that passion and, and wanting to do things and everything else. And it's not like they make a lot of money. So we get 5,000 people who make $4 a day. And then maybe about 500 of them make eight, about 50 of them make 16, and maybe five of them make 32. So you, you build that pyramid, and now you have this capacity to, to sort of, if you come up with a solution, you can expand that solution. So first, you need to co-create the solution so that you really have a solution that they have created with you. Secondly, you need to build capacity to spread the solution. Thirdly, if you really have a good solution for these people at the bottom of the pyramid, they should be craving for it. You know, they should be coming and asking you to, to, to come and do it. And I'll talk a couple of examples as to how we sort of do that acid test. And if you did that, then I think you have a proof of concept. And to be able to get there, most of the innovation that you need are, it's more innovating in, in, in trying to connect with these people and very simple ideas. And, and so we've done about 130 of these different programs, interventions, out of which about 25 of them are looking pretty good. And so let me talk about maybe three of them and tell you what we need to do and how everybody in this room can contribute to that next stage of the, of the evolution of these programs. So how many of you have heard about Akshay Patra? Okay, quite a few. For those of you who have not heard it, it's a midday meal program, and this organization said, we can't have children come hungry to school. So they built a kitchen using advanced engineering, supply chain, procurement, accounting, all the good stuff. And they, they make, let's say, in the sandbox that we have, which is like a living lab, they have their biggest kitchen. And in that one kitchen, they make 180,000 meals a day, hot meals which they serve to only school children, midday meal, is 12 cents a meal, $30 feeds a child for the whole year. Because it's a government program, it works together with the government, and the government gives the $15 they would have spent otherwise, and we raise the other $15. And today, after 15 years, we are serving 1.6 million meals every day. So, so that's impressive, right? But there is 100 million children who need to be fed in India. So the question is, 
how do you get to that next stage? How do you go from 1.6 to, to the bigger number? And to get there, I think that's where you need a little bit more system engineering, system thinking, system, you know, where, where we need bigger brains to sort of interact with these programs. You know, we, we need to figure out what are the better public-private partnerships? What are better technology platforms? What's a, is there a better way to uh, do nutrition and cut the cost of that program even more? Uh, so, so we need big thinking after you have built the capacity to absorb that thinking. And, and the mistake the world makes is that a lot of the innova innovators, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's MIT, Stanford, Harvard, or, or any of these places, or think tanks, or major foundations, the amount of compassion that they have to help these poor people, to help at the bottom of the pyramid, is amazing. It's amazing to see how much compassion they have. But unfortunately, they all start with the wrong question. The question they ask themselves is, what can I give that I have? And most of the people are very bright, right? And so they say, I'm bright. I can come up with a solution. I can come up with an idea. Unfortunately, it's the wrong starting point. Because if you come up with a solution, you have two problems. Number one, it's unlikely that your solution will be relevant or something that they would like because you're not co-created it. Secondly, even if you come up with a perfect solution, there is no capacity to spread the solution out among people. So the big thinkers need to make sure that they find platforms, they find these ecosystems where people are already prepped and they're ready for bigger ideas. Because you know, if you have people, like for example, MIT has this program called the Tata Fellows, where Ratan Tata funded them to, to actually uh, have impact on India. So the Tata Fellows, you know, even though I am very closely associated with MIT and closely associated with the sandbox in India, for the first 10 years, we actually very deliberately keep them away. Because collaboration cannot happen between a strong and a weak. For the collaboration to happen, you need two strong people. But now, the sandbox in India is, is pretty strong. So when MIT interacts with the sandbox, it's almost like peer-to-peer -peer interaction. And therefore, the bigger ideas, the sandbox is slowly getting ready to absorb bigger ideas from other people. So, so make sure that if, if you are the big thinker, if you have big ideas, and if you want to have impact at the bottom of the pyramid, that you take those ideas to places where people have the ability to absorb those ideas. You cannot start in vacuum. So, so let, me, let me talk about a couple of other programs and, and, and tell you how uh, you, know, you, can, you can sort of, you know whether something is ready or not. For example, uh, four years ago, Ratan Tata, when he came to the sandbox, um, we, we talked about a problem that a lot of the farmers have in India, which is water. Water is the biggest problem. And, and a lot of these places, they get about 50 centimeters of rain, which is quite a bit of rain, but 50 centimeters is considered famine, 100 is flood, and the problem is you don't get the rain when you need it, right? And, and water is the biggest multiplier of income for farmers. So if you just dig a hole that's 100 feet by 100 feet by 12 feet, it can do rainwater harvesting, and it's good enough to irrigate about five acres of land. In five acres, on an average, a farmer makes about 20,000 rupees an acre, about one lakh for the five acres. But if you dig this hole and create this farm pond, they can actually make anywhere from three to five lakhs a year. So it's a, it's a huge impact. And so, so he gave us five machines just to see if this would work. And so the, the team there, now because we have all this training program, we have like lots of people who are available to actually work at very little salary and are very connected with the people in the community there. We came up with a program where we crank out a farm pond every 40 hours nonstop. Every machine makes a farm pond every 40 hours nonstop. And the variable cost of a farm pond is 40,000 rupees, and the farmer actually pays for it, right? And, and now, so we got 30 machines working away right now, creating these farm ponds. And the, so, so what happens is the 
how do we know whether people need it or not? So here, after the model is proven, they don't go to any place without, let's say typically a village would need like 50 farm ponds. All the 50 farmers have to get together. They have to get the Sarpanch, the, the head of the panchayat, to actually sign that letter. So all of them sign all the letter. They deposit that money with a self-help group. And then they come to the foundation and say, please come to our village and, and do this. So, and now we have a backlog of 5,000 ponds, right, that people want. So when people actually come to you and they actually request, then it's very easy to beat all the political intervention, bureaucracy, everything else, because now there is a huge pull from the people who need it. You know, this is very much like in the developed part of the economy coming with the hot seller, which just like, just flies out of the factory. And so, but then, now we need some big ideas because the India does not need 30 machines, they probably need three million machines. So how do you go from where we are now to actually having a big impact? Similar to, you know, similarly malnutrition. You know, if you go to a typical village, a village would have about 60 children in the age group of two to six, out of which about 30 of them on an average have malnutrition. Our team, with very simple, again, these people who make 10,000 rupees a month, each employee looks after about 100 children, and they give them some simple intervention like spirulina, uh, peanut butter paste, and, and dry banana. Um, and they visit them every day, they weigh them, they teach them hygiene and all those things. And, and about 90% of the children, there'll be about, typically about 10% of the children, three or four children in a village, who have medical complications and therefore it's way beyond the capability of these young kids. But 90% of the children in three years become normal, right? So, so if, if it's, if it's, so how do we make 625,000 villages malnutrition free? So, so to be able to do that, we again need some, some bigger thinking. We need people who can sort of really take something simple that works and create a better public-private partnership and, and uh, you know, better technology platforms and all those things. And so if you want to have an impact, if you have a big idea, if you want to have an impact on the, on the developed economy, on the top two billion people, you take the idea and make it most relevant, and then most probably you'll have an impact. You know? And then there's always execution risk, but if not you, somebody else who has the same idea will have an impact. So the idea does find an impact as long as you direct it to some burning problem that people have. If you have a desire to have an impact at the bottom of the pyramid, you have to start with relevance. You have to create a co-create a solution. You have to build a capacity so that you can spread this solution out if you have the opportunity to spread it out. You know you have a good solution if people in those communities are actually begging you to come and do it as opposed to you imposing the solution on them. And if you did all that, you can have a pretty good impact. But if you really want to scale it big time, because you know, nonprofits, it doesn't matter whether it's US or India, they're not used to thinking systems level thinking. They're not sort of saying, okay, how do we fix the problem so that it's 60% of the market share or 70% of the market share? And it's not like you have to do everything, but you have to figure out a way so that you can actually impact a big piece of that population that you're trying to serve. For that, I think, is where we need a lot of systems thinking. And that's why we need a lot of the people in this room. So we just launched a program called the Fellows Program, where people can come and spend three months in the sandbox to, to share their big ideas. They can, they can inject new ideas into the sandbox so that all these young men and women can, can maybe take up those ideas and do something with them. But also look at some of the ideas that are working and help those people figure out a way to scale them to, to a lot bigger than where they are. And so, so I think if, and, and it's a continuum, you know, if it's, a, it's a big I, small r at the very top, because unless you have an idea that the world has not seen before, it's very hard to compete in the, in the, in the developed economy. At the, at the very bottom, relevance takes a big, big importance. 
And then everything in between, it's, it's sort of like you need a, a right mix of innovation and relevance to play in those markets. And, and why, why is this important globally? Because I think previously, it, all the innovation happened only in the top two billion. Now there's quite a bit going on in the bottom five billion. And a lot of the ideas will go back and forth. And in India is, is very uniquely suited to, to innovate in those, the, the five billion people market because India has three things going for it which are very unique in the world. Number one, about 1% 1 of the Indian population is globally competent. And they're globally competent in pretty much every field, whether it's engineering or medicine or, or accounting or law, or anything. And therefore, you got 1%, 12 million people who are as competent as anybody else in this room. You have a stark reality. You got 800 people who actually need those solutions right in front of your eyes. And thirdly, you have the freedom to operate. So you can create a lot of interventions. And when you create these interventions, they become financially sustainable one of the three ways. Either they become a free market economy, if you're targeting the solution to people who can pay a little bit, or it becomes a part of a government program because government is the one that invests a lot of money. And if you can bring innovation to the government program, that becomes a source of way to uh, support the intervention or a broad-based charity. And the more you go to the bottom of the pyramid, the more you have to make it a combination of all the three. And so, so you can create some very exciting uh, innovations all the way from the very bottom to $2 a day to $4 to $8 to $16 to $32. And, and India is uniquely positioned to solve that problem and then take those solutions global. And, and also, this whole methodology, I think, is applicable everywhere. Because about five years ago, you know, initially we thought US needs technological innovation and you, India needs social innovation. And then we realized that India needs technological innovation because they have to build power plants, they have to build infrastructure, everything else. And US needs social innovation. So we brought that concept back to US. So we had this program called the Merrimack Valley Sandbox in Lowell, Lawrence. And that has morphed into a program called e for all Entrepreneurship for All. And you can see it now play out globally, whether it's, whether it's you know, that is somehow, whether it's US or Japan or France or UK or Germany, you can see that this globalization is, is essentially splitting the population. You know, the globalization, because of the free movement of goods and capital and talent and everything else, the smart people, it's amazing how much a smart person can do with his own efforts, with his own ideas. Huge impact, huge wealth creation, but it leaves a whole bunch of people behind. And it's happening everywhere. And the only way you, you bring these people back into the thing is, is by making them into innovators. You have to create capacity within those communities to actually absorb these ideas and become a part of the, 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 the economic game. Otherwise, you're not going to get there. In fact, you know, so this e for all program that we have here in US, it's now running in three places, in Lower Lawrence, in Lynn, and in South Coast, Fall River and uh, Bedford. And it's applicable to 300 different places. And, and so, so we started long before this, this new thing started in, uh, in, in US about helping these people actually become a part of the economic thing. Because the, the problem is, it's always the think tank, it's the policy makers in Washington, it's the big thinkers who come up with the programs for these people, and these people don't benefit because they don't have the capacity to absorb. In, in a simple way, I think the philosophy or foundation has boiled down to something very simple. There are three types of people in this world. Some people are oblivious to everything. That's not any of you. There are some people who see a problem and complain, and some people who see a problem and get all excited. And the only difference between a vibrant community and an impoverished community is a mix of these people, right? And so in impoverished communities, whether it's in US or India or anywhere else, the people who complain are the people who, because their problems have become chronic, and once people become chronic, problems become chronic, they try a little bit, and then they feel victimized, 
and then they feel helpless. And then they feel like the only thing they can do is to complain. And then the steady state we have reached is that they're supposed to sit there and complain, and somebody else is supposed to come and solve the problem. But whenever somebody else comes and brings a solution, they don't have ownership there, and they don't have the capacity to absorb it. As a result, we are not able to solve those problems. So the only way we solve those problems is if we make those people into entrepreneurs, make those people into innovators, and build the capacity within that community to actually absorb those new ideas. And then you can take all kinds of new ideas to them. And so I think it's, a, it's, it's something where this innovation entrepreneurship is exactly what is creating this big divide. Because it's, it's innovation entrepreneurship, that's ab ability to create a lot of wealth for a few people, is what's creating this problem. But it's exactly the same tool, I think, that can also fix the divide. It, it, if, you, if you take the same tools to the people who have been left out of the economic game, I think we can bring them back into the game. And, and, uh, and, and I'm very excited. And I know a lot of the people here are already working on those kinds of programs. And, uh, and India, in some ways, is a very exciting place. And, uh, and I think it can really, really bring some new ways and new ways of thinking to have an impact that the world has not seen before. Thank you. Um, for those who have Q&A for uh, questions for Dr. Deshpande, they can come either here or on the other side of the mic. Uh, please speak into the mic, and Dr. Deshpande will answer. Sir, so thank you for a very inspiring speech. Uh, my question is in two parts. How important is mentorship for young entrepreneurs? The reason I ask is I've established the largest free innovation startup ecosystem in 7,000 schools and colleges in India, and I also direct the first ever reality TV show for student, uh, student entrepreneurs. But what I've seen is that students in schools and colleges are far more inclined towards innovating and being an entrepreneur now compared to about 15, 20 years ago. But the reality is, less than 1% of the startups in India today are successful. So don't you think the problem is guidance and mentorship? Uh, so that is the first part of the question. The second part is social innovators like you are exceedingly and understandably inaccessible. Um, wouldn't you think that you would impact the startup ecosystem in India if you took up mentorship roles in several social enterprises? Right, right, right. So I, I, think, I think you're right. So, you know, it, it's essentially four things to make sure that entrepreneurship becomes successful. Number one, you need good ideas, you need good entrepreneurs, you need good mentors, and you need access to capital. And, and you have to do that in scale. So, so the way we do it in the sandbox is that we have a program where four college kids come together, pick a problem in the society and solve it. So now we've had 30,000 kids do something or the other. And so, the subtle difference is that, you know, when kids go to college, essentially that's what happens. The professor gives them a problem and they solve a problem. But there is a big difference between a student falling in love with a problem and a professor giving a problem. When professor gives a problem, it's homework. When a student picks a problem, it's an entrepreneurial experience. And, and so, so that happens well. Now, in terms of connecting mentors at different level, you know, we have a program for, called Navodhyomi where we, you know, right now, we are working with about 5,000 micro entrepreneurs. These are the guys who make 10,000 to 20,000 rupees a month. And, and so we bring MBA 101 to those guys. And, and so a lot of the entrepreneurs who run a business, let's say one crore, two crores, which is a very small business, are fantastic mentors for these little guys. And the guys who do 20 crores are good mentors for two crores. So, so you really build, need to build that ecosystem. So we have a pretty nice ecosystem now where everybody is a mentor to somebody else. And being a mentor, I think uh, as soon as people realize that being a mentor is not necessarily just giving back, but it's a great way to reinvent yourself, I think it becomes a very attractive proposition for everybody. Thank you very much for the speech. You, through your uh, talk, you answered a lot of unanswered questions I had in my mind. Uh, 
My question is related to failure, and often people who you've spoken about and who the gentleman before me spoke about are bubbling with passion. And when you're bubbling with passion and you confront failure, you're either overwhelmed with you know, shock or sometimes guilt when you want to do something for a social cause. Could you please explain how to be resilient to such situations and move forward from your personal experience and from the people who you've worked with? Thank you. So, so the question is, uh, how do you passion? Like, I, sorry, I missed the question. With failure or a slightly difficult situation when things don't go as per planned, how do you like reboot and get back on track? Right. So, so you know, I think innovation entrepreneurship is all about experimentation, and experimentation is about trying different things, which may or may not work. So, failure becomes a part of that whole process, right? And so, the the only good thing you can do about failures is that you can fail fast and you can fail small. And that's where it helps if you have an ecosystem, if you have other people that are working with you. So, for example, when I started my first company in 1986, 87, there were very few entrepreneurs in Boston. So it was not like there was this big ecosystem, lean methodology and all that kind of stuff. So you have to pretty much reinvent everything for yourself. But now, uh, you can become a part of the ecosystem. And that ecosystem, as it develops, you know, the closest analogy I can think of is, is childbirth. You know, there is seven billion kids born, and therefore a kid being born is nothing new, right? But for every mother and father, it's a roller coaster ride. Every childbirth is, is quite an emotional experience for the, for the parents. And, but if you looked at the childbirth, let's say 150 years ago, the infant mortality was very high, but now it's, it's fairly low because the ecosystem is very good in terms of nurturing uh, the parents and making sure that everything goes well and so on. So similarly, the, the concept of all these incubators, education, uh, mentorship, everything else, is to improve the success rate of the entrepreneurship, of that ability to bring about a new change to the world. But that roller coaster ride will always be a part of that entrepreneur. And, and the ability to enjoy that roller coaster ride is what differentiates an entrepreneur from a non-entrepreneur. 